Chapter 7 Gases, Liquids, Solids, and Phase Diagrams Section 7.4 The PT Phase Diagram Here P and T denotes pressure and temperature. We're looking at the PT Phase Diagram of CO2. You can see there are three different phases solid phase, liquid phase, and gas phase. The supercritical fluid is not usually considered a phase. It's between a liquid and a gas. It has properties between those of a liquid and those of a gas. Now let's define phase. It's a form of matter that is uniform with respect to chemical composition and the state of aggregation at microscopic and macroscopic level. So for example, if you have a pure substance, we have three different phases, but if you have two substances, even if you just look at the liquid, water and liquid vegetable oil, you mix them, you will still form two phases. In one phase, you have water. In the other phase, you have oil because they are not miscible with each other. Oil and water are not soluble in each other. Therefore, you have two different phases. They are both liquid phases if you have water and oil. However, if you have water and ethanol, you mix them, you have a single liquid phase because uh, in that mixture, you have a uniform chemical composition and also the state of aggregation is simply the liquid. And uh, overall, the chemical environment of each water molecule is about the same. The chemical environment for each ethanol molecule is also about the same. Uh, although those molecules move around, but on average, each molecule has roughly the same environment. Uh, now let's review a thermodynamic function and uh, first let's look at G. G over here is commonly used in uh, phase diagram analysis. This is because uh, very commonly we have information about temperature and pressure of a substance. And we know Gibbs energy of such a substance always decreases given the temperature and pressure until this G reaches the minimum. So if you give me a temperature and pressure and tell me the molar Gibbs energy of the liquid phase versus the molar Gibbs energy of the gas phase, at that temperature and that pressure, I can determine which phase is more stable because the phase with lower molar Gibbs energy is more stable. The molar Gibbs energy should reach the minimum uh, if you wait long enough. That's after the system reaches equilibrium, okay? And all this statement is based on one assumption that is when there's no non-expansion work. If there is non-expansion work, for example, if you're doing some electric work to the system, it's possible to actually increase the Gibbs energy of that substance. So again, when there's no non-expansion work, and then we can say the Gibbs energy always decreases at constant temperature and pressure. And if you have a fixed amount of substances, you can also say its molar Gibbs energy should be uh, the minimum at equilibrium, and then there's no more change. Therefore, the PT diagram can easily show us which phase has the lowest molar Gibbs energy. You just look for the most stable phase. Here, I'll give you one example. Let's uh, have this pressure 10 bars, all right? Pressure 10 bars. Now we need to specify temperature as well. What if it's 10 bar and 200 Kelvin? So it's this data point. The solid phase uh, is the most stable phase. Therefore, the molar Gibbs energy of solid CO2, this is carbon dioxide, and th this means the molar Gibbs energy of solid CO2 is lower than that of liquid CO2 and also lower than that of gas CO2. But what if you change the temperature to 225 Kelvin? Well, 225, that's uh, between 200 and 250, somewhere here. And then, of course, the liquid phase has the lowest molar Gibbs energy. What if the temperature is 250? Now it's here, 250 and 10 bar. The gas phase has the lowest molar Gibbs energy among all. 
Also, we can have a fixed temperature, let's say 280 Kelvin, somewhere here. And then we look at different pressures. When the pressure is one bar, the gas phase has the lowest molar Gibbs energy. 10 bars um, steel gas, 100 bars liquid, 10,000 bars then solid phase is the most stable state. So if you have a CO2 gas at 280 Kelvin, which is 7 degrees Celsius, you can have the gas phase or liquid phase or solid phase depending on how much pressure you exert to the CO2. And uh, now let's look at this triple point. Uh, at triple point, the solid, liquid, and gas phases coexist. There are three phases, that's why it's called a triple point right here. And we can estimate the triple point for CO2. I think it's roughly 220-ish uh, Kelvin. Uh, and over here, uh, this is log re uh, logarithm um, scale. So I don't know, this might be seven-ish, seven bars. And uh, under that pressure at this temperature, you have three phases coexist for pure CO2. Now let's look at the supercritical fluid. It's not really a new phase. It's just between a liquid and gas. Uh, let's look at this line between a uh, solid and liquid. If you look at this curve, this curvy line between the solid and liquid, it actually tells you what the melting point of CO2 under different pressures. You can see if the pressure is 10 bars, the melting point is roughly uh, 220, a bit lower than 220. But if the pressure is a thousand bars, so you draw a line here, horizontal line here, this is about a thousand bars, and then you draw a line down here. I think the melting point changes to 230, 230. So if you have a very high pressure over here, for example, over here, and then you draw a line down there, well, the melting point can exceed 250 Kelvin. So really, the melting point of CO2 uh, is not a number. You have a range here from here to here. That's a melting point range for CO2. All right, it's just you have to specify the pressure. What if you have a pressure of only one bar? You can see under one bar pressure, well, we cannot even have the liquid phase. Under one bar pressure, well, on the right hand side, you have the gas phase. On the left hand side, you have the solid phase. So really, if you extend this line somewhere here, you can see uh, there's only a sublimation point. There's no melting point. There's only one sublimation point from uh, solid on the left to the gas on the right at one bar pressure. That's why we do not usually see liquid CO2. It's called dry ice for that reason. But if you really want to make liquid CO2, it's possible. You just need to increase the pressure, for example, to 10 bars, and uh, we have a temperature range for CO2. Uh, in the liquid phase from here to here. So you have a roughly uh, 10 Kelvin temperature range, maybe uh, around 10, a little bit more than 10 Kelvin. So over here you have a liquid CO2. And actually in this video, I think they will make liquid CO2. They do need a very high pressure. So let's uh, look at uh, look at this person. Uh, he's uh, wearing a shell to protect himself because of the high pressure. It's holding liquid CO2 because the pressure Once is the pressure uh, really approaches. high inside. So I can only show you just a few kind of just uh, uh, a few seconds of the video. Container, whereas the rest of it is cooled down, but inside the container will rise uh, you can very see. rapidly as its temperature approaches room temperature. Releasing All right, I think you can see some liquid, liquid CO2, to turn back but after solid. the uh, pressure is released, uh, you will see uh, the uh, CO2 I hope becomes you found this a solid video phase again. All right, get back to this. Um, uh, the PT phase diagram under 10 bar pressure, CO2 undergoes fusion and vaporization. When its temperature changes from 200 uh, Kelvin to 250 Kelvin. So I'm showing you this arrow from 200 to 250. So make sure you understand, you know, what this arrow means. And also we have another arrow in this uh, phase diagram. So this is 280 Kelvin. And we're uh, looking at the pressure change from 10,000 bars to one bar. So uh, over here at a constant temperature, 280 Kelvin, 
we can observe the fusion of CO2 here and we can observe the vaporization of CO2 here uh, all by changing the pressure there's no temperature change at all so it's kind of interesting to melt CO2 you do not change the temperature you just change the pressure to vaporize uh, liquid CO2 you just change the pressure again all right so you decrease the pressure and then you can observe first from solid to liquid and then from liquid to to gas uh, and also you can see this line this line is the uh, for the uh, vaporization uh, from liquid to gas or for the condensation from gas back to liquid how about this line this line is between uh, the solid phase and gas phase so from left to right crossing this line is called the sublimation if we go backward from gas to solid uh, you can say it's desublimation or condensation or deposition uh, but condensation actually means from gas to either liquid or solid so when you say condensation you probably want to say to liquid or to solid but if you say desublimation it's more clear I guess and deposition is also from gas to solid but when you say deposition it's very often people understand this is done on a another surface another solid surface deposition so desublimation probably is more clear than the other two words condensation or deposition uh, again let's uh, look at uh, this uh, three lines those are so-called uh, coexistence lines okay coexistent lines because two different phases coexist on, along the line so let's look at this line uh, solid and liquid coexist along this line now let's look at this line the liquid phase and gas phase coexist along this line and finally the sublimation line okay the solid and the gas phase coexist along this line all right and finally the triple point again the triple point is when the three phases coexist you have solid liquid and gas phase coexist at this temperature 217 Kelvin and uh, around 5 bars 5 point something bars that's the triple point and below this pressure below this pressure uh, 5.12 pressure uh, liquid CO2 is never stable liquid CO2 is never stable because under this pressure you can see you can only have uh, either solid or gas or well on this line both solid and gas uh, now let's look at this temperature this temperature is so called the critical temperature of CO2 uh, this uh, is 304 Kelvin uh, which is roughly 31 degrees Celsius and a very high pressure 75 bars pressure over here this is the critical point again uh, this axis is logarithm so it's 110 100 so I mean just roughly this is 75 uh, beyond this critical point you do not have a liquid or a gas you have something so-called supercritical fluid what is this this is again not a new phase it's just between liquid and the gas that's why we call this a fluid and it's super critical fluid because it's above the critical point and whenever you talk about the critical point of co2 carbon dioxide or any other substances you need to give two numbers one what's the temperature two what's the pressure so for co2 it's uh, 304 kelvin and 75 bars so over here we have supercritical fluid so uh, in this video they make supercritical fluid of co2 so I'm gonna show you a few seconds of this uh, this is a container that can resist very high pressure uh, they have a number here showing you temperature in degrees Celsius and then I'm gonna fast forward so they are boiling this uh, co2 liquid right now you see this is liquid and on top of liquid we cannot see the gas phase you know it's just uh, transparent it's colorless but still you just imagine all right this is the uh, uh, a combination of liquid and uh, and 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 the gas but now okay once the pressure is really high and temperature is above 31 they have one homogeneous face it's a new face no it's not really a new face it's just a face between a liquid face and a gas face it's called a supercritical fluid 
and I think at the end they will uh, just lower the temperature again and then um, you will have separated the liquid and uh, and, and the gas alright uh, so I'm gonna have to pause this now let's uh, get back to uh, over here uh, so we have the critical point for carbon dioxide and you can look up the critical point for many other substances like water like nitrogen etc uh, it's just uh, safe and easy to make super critical fluid of CO2 so in industry uh, this uh, super critical fluid of CO2 is used to extract caffeine from those coffee beans that's why we can uh, have those uh, decaffeinated coffee beans all right so uh, caffeine can be dissolved in supercritical fluid of CO2 again I mean CO2 is uh, non-toxic uh, now let's uh, look at back this here um, a supercritical fluid can fully occupy the container so if you look at this statement uh, a supercritical fluid is like a gas because a gas can occupy the entire container a liquid cannot you know because of the gravity the liquid will occupy the bottom part of the container right but this uh, supercritical fluid has a density closer to that of a liquid phase uh, how close usually you know we know the density of the liquid is roughly a thousand times the density of the gas so what about supercritical uh, fluid it's about one-third of the density of liquid and 300 times the density of the gas so in that sense the density of a supercritical fluid is closer to a liquid it's more like a liquid however it occupies the whole container in a homogeneous manner so in that sense it looks like a gas but with a density close to a liquid at the critical point uh, we have this delta p over delta v is zero uh, and the second derivative of P uh, over volume is also zero. I put a molar volume here, but they are just the same if you have a fixed amount of CO2. So when you do the experiment, when you are tr trying to find when this first derivative and the second derivative are both zero, just make sure you do not add CO2 in the system. Do not kind of take CO2 away from the system. And therefore, if delta P over delta V is zero, then delta P over delta V sub M is also zero. Same here, we have similar analysis here. And why do we need these two equations? Actually, uh, if you have a Vanderbilt's gas, uh, we have the equation of P. P is a function of molar volume. We can just uh, derive the first derivative of P with respect to V and then second derivative, and we set them zero and we solve these equations. All right, now let's uh, look at another phase diagram for the CO2. And over here we have pressure, over here we have specific volume. Uh, this is cubic meter over kilogram. So if you have a fixed amount of CO2, just don't worry too much about this specific volume. You can just imagine this is just pressure versus volume for a fixed amount of CO2. Now you can see at higher temperature, 100 degrees Celsius, it behaves more ideally because pressure is inversely proportional to volume. Again, you can just imagine this is just volume. It's just I cannot find a good picture of pressure versus volume. I found this pressure versus specific volume instead uh, on this uh, Wikipedia page. That's why 80 degrees still like ideal 60. Well, some distortion from uh, this uh, previous curves, 40 degrees. You can see over here, there's something going on. It's a little bent over here, right? And then 31 degrees Celsius, that's the critical point. This is the critical point, all right? So first you can compress the gas, but right here, uh, you are looking at the critical point at 31 degrees Celsius or 304 Kelvin right here. And what about the pressure? I think it's about 75 bars, all right? It should be 74.8 bars over here. All right, so what if you have a temperature below the critical point? Well, below the critical point, for example, let's look at this curve. It's 20 degrees Celsius. First, you have a gas, but then at uh, this point. So you are uh, compressing this CO2 gas at 20 degrees Celsius from right to left. Okay, from right to left. At here, um, you can no longer increase the pressure anymore. 
So if you try to increase the pressure, you are actually just compressing the CO2 gas into the liquid phase. That's why you see a horizontal line here, a straight line here. That means pressure can no longer be increased. The pressure remains constant. You are simply changing the volume because you're converting gas to liquid. So you are compressing CO2 from the gas phase to the liquid phase. At this point, I think you have just pure CO2 liquid. There's only one phase here. Now, if you further increase the pressure, you are uh, simply just compressing the liquid phase. It's really, really hard to compress the liquid phase. That's why uh, you are seeing this uh, really sharp pressure increase okay when the volume is below this point you can see we're trying to liquid uh, we're trying to uh, reduce the volume of the liquid phase and you know it's hard you know it's hard to change the volume of the liquid phase uh, uh, to the left hand side of this data point you have just the liquid co2 and this is uh, zero degree celsius same analysis uh, you can compress this uh, co2 gas until here and starting from here you're just converting co2 gas to the liquid phase and uh, after this point you are just uh, compressing the co2 liquid at zero degree celsius again we mentioned how to compute the critical point you simply have delta p over delta t equals zero and the second derivative of p with respect to v is also zero because uh, we usually use a fixed amount of substance and then you can just uh, take delta p over delta vm as well first we write out p as a function of vm uh, using this vanuals uh, model so to describe a real gas uh, we're, we're just assuming the co2 uh, is a vanuals uh, gas uh, with parameter a and b to um, uh, describe the attraction and repulsion between uh, CO2 molecules and what we do is we simply do mathematics over here the first derivative we just take the first derivative of this and we get this we set it to zero at the cri critical point uh, and then we take the second derivative and set it to zero so if we go back to here so really it's just worth saying that over here the slope is zero and also the change of slope is also zero right here at this critical point all right uh, the slope is zero that means delta p over delta v is zero at this point and then the second derivative uh, is also zero that means uh, the change of the slope with respect to volume is also zero all right okay get back to here so uh, we do need to use calculus to convert this delta p over delta v to uh, algebraic uh, equation over here and also uh, the second derivative another algebraic equation these two are set to zero at the critical point and then we have this equation and this equation two equations you can see they look similar to each other you have uh, similar terms so I'm gonna just use equation one divided by equation two so this divided by this we have something here this divided by this we have something else here left equals right we actually can compute the molar volume at the critical point and we use C to denote critical so this is critical molar volume it's actually 3b it's 3b the density of the supercritical fluid is thus roughly one third of the density of the liquid phase and now we plug in this uh, critical molar volume equals 3b into equation 1 we have this equation and we can solve for the critical temperature t sub c stands for critical temperature this uh, c in the subscript denotes critical and we get this equation 8 over 27 a over br and 8 over 27 is 0.296 and we can see the critical temperature is roughly 30% of the boil temperature. A over BR is the boil temperature. So at boil temperature, actually, uh, the real gas pressure is equal to the ideal gas pressure. That's the definition of boil temperature. All right, and finally, we can compute the critical pressure just using this equation, because we now have the critical temperature, we have critical molar volume, we just plug in all those expressions we get critical pressure it's 8 over 27 b squared and you can see if we have a large attraction smaller repulsion 
we have a very high critical pressure but if we have very large repulsion very small attraction we have lower critical pressure and again we solved the uh, equation for the first derivative and the second derivative of pressure with respect to volume or molar volume and then we get the expressions for P, T and V uh, actually this molar volume for a venomous gas at the critical point we have these three expressions so uh, and also we can just multiply P and V you can see we multiply the critical pressure and critical molar volume and see uh, how does this compare to RT if you uh, do all those uh, derivation this is pretty easy you get actually only 3 8 RT off at the critical point so remember if you have an ideal gas PV uh, is equal to RT so PVM is equal to RT but this is only uh, eight, uh, 3 8 or 0 0.375 times RTC so it behaves quite differently quite differently from the ideal gas behavior and the compression factor is much smaller than one it's only 3 8 or 0 0.375 uh, in this case we know the attraction is predominant because C is much less than one uh, in this section let's look at just the one numerical example problem 7.4.1 calculate the critical temperature and pressure of nitrogen given its venerable parameters a and b so over here t sub c is 8a over 27 rb we just plug in all the numbers uh pay attention here i'm using bar liters for this uh number for this number it's uh in liters so over here this is the ideal gas constant in bar and liters so this is 0 0.083 uh, bar liter over Kelvin mole. So now we just make sure all the units are used consistently. Those are not as units, but I used those units consistently. I get 120, uh, 126 Kelvin. And now let's look at the critical pressure. It's A over 27 B squared. Plug in all those numbers. We get 34 bars and we get the uh, critical molar volume for nitrogen as well. It's this much 0.116 liter per mole so over here we have all those uh, critical pressure temperature and molar volume calculated using uh, these equations and these equations come from the Venables equation of state uh, the values of parameters a and b of many many Venables gases are just tabulated in uh, appendix d and you can look up the critical temperature and pressure for some uh, selected substances such as water uh, in Appendix F.